Um, there was just one person at that table, but he was, he was on his phone. Uh, and so uh, I wasn't trying to listen then, but, but I heard him suddenly say, this is a direct quote, I know, and that's the last time I'll ever let a dog be part of a wedding. <laughs> so I stopped. Because now I was interested. And uh, I'm not necessarily proud of it, but perhaps you can understand. I started eavesdropping like crazy uh, to this guy on the phone next to me. I was trying to piece together what the situation could have possibly been that he was talking about on the phone that elicited that response. Right? And it was hard to do. I was listening around, and I never figured out exactly. I didn't have the courage to ask him. I didn't want him to know I was listening in. Um, but it's, it's, it was hard because, because I was only hearing half the conversation, right? Just that, that one bit. I was only hearing his half of the conver conversation. And I was thinking how that, that, happens, that happens a lot nowadays, right? With, with phones everywhere. Right? Restaurants, coffee shops, or or just standing in line somewhere, maybe in the grocery store or the bank, right? We get, we get privy to so many half conversations. And it is, so it is, it is hard not to become eavesdroppers, isn't it? Trying to you hear a little thing like that, and now you're suddenly you're trying to, to piece together what the, situ, what's the situation was that, that you're only hearing half the story of, only hearing the, the responses or uh, and not what's initiating them, or, uh, or maybe only hearing the the advice that's being given, but not the reason uh, that the advice is needed in the first place. We get, we hear these kind of half conversations all the time. And I bring that up uh, because something like that is going on in our scripture reading this morning that we're going to get to here in, in just, a, just a few moments. We're, we're going to be reading from the New Testament uh, book of Philemon. Uh, it's called Philemon because... Uh, it's a letter from the Apostle Paul, as uh, mentioned with the, with the children just a moment ago. Uh, it's a letter from the Apostle Paul to a man named Philemon. And it's a short little letter. Uh, it's one of the shortest books in the Bible. It's only 25 verses long. Um, so if you, if you blink, uh, you, you might miss it. It's nestled uh, right in between the, the, the New Testament books, Titus and Hebrews. Um, we'll read it here in just, just a moment. Uh, if you want to if you want to follow along when I do read it here shortly, uh, you can go ahead and, and open up your Bibles. Um, you can find it in the, the Pew Bible in the New Testament, uh, beginning on page 215. But before we read it, um, we just finished our summer series on Sabbath last week. Uh, so today, uh, we're jumping back into following the lectionary readings each Sunday. And specifically, we're going to begin looking at the, uh, the New Testament epistles, uh, or letters, um, that, that show up in the, the upcoming lectionary readings as we head into the, into the fall. And, and since Philemon is, is so short, and it only appears once in the, in the lectionary, it only comes around once every three years if you follow the lectionary, um, and it's paired with a uh, passage um, from Jeremiah and a passage from Luke, these big names in the Bible, so even when it does come around, uh, Philemon's got some heavy competition, so it's not a book uh, that is often preached on. And it also has a history. It has a problematic history of how it's been used in the church. See, this letter it is a very focused letter, and it's dealing with a very specific issue. It's the issue of a runaway slave named Onesimus. Because Paul does not, in this letter, come out um, as he's navigating the, the problem that's arisen that he's addressing. Paul doesn't come out and explicitly say slavery is evil, or that all slaves, or, or that even this slave, Onesimus, he doesn't explicitly say he should be freed. Um, this is one of the places in the Bible that was used in our country's history to uphold the institution of slavery. And not only that, as we'll see, uh, what's going on here is that Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, the slave owner. And so even, even when our country had things like the Fugitive Slave Act, these laws that were about requiring runaway slaves to be returned to their masters because they were just desperately trying to find freedom, 
This book, Lehman, was used to justify those kind of laws. Right? And, and this whole topic, right, before we get, in, get into this book, I just want to say this whole topic issue, it deserves a much longer conversation. But we don't have time um, today, so let me, just, let me just say two things about that here. First, slavery in any form, at any time, it is an affront to God, to each other, because all people bear the very image of God, period. And second, the way slavery worked in ancient times was different than the institution of chattel slavery we participated in here in this country. Both those things are true, right? And so that, that in and of itself deserves a much longer conversation than we're going to have, have here. Um, but along those lines, just as another side note, we just had last month was the 400th anniversary of the first slaves that were brought to North America. It is, it is well, well worth the time to read on the history of that. Um, things like uh, the, the New York Times put out this big story, Project 1619, uh, that, that talks about, uh, gives a survey of the history. You can find it online about our history and, and how that history is still deeply affecting our present. It's well worth our time to go and consider, to read and consider and explore. I just wanted to say that um, because slavery does come up in this, this book, uh, Lehman, that we're, that we're reading, all right? All that is to say, this book in the Bible is one that is not often preached. It doesn't come around but every three years in the lectionary, and it has a problematic history of use and abuse. It is a problematic book about a problem that arose in one of the early churches. This morning, we are going to look at it. Before we do, I want to give a few words of context for this letter. As I alluded to a few moments ago, and in this letter, we are, we are eavesdropping, right? We are hearing one half of a conversation, one half of a situation that was going on. But thankfully, Bible scholars are as much eavesdroppers as the rest of us, as those of us who find ourselves in restaurants and coffee shops and, and checkout lines. And so they have been listening very intently to this half of the conversation and, and have been able to dig out, um, dig into the clues that we have in this letter to help us give a fuller picture of what's going on. This letter was written by Paul to Philemon, who lived in the city of Colossae, uh, which would be in modern day Turkey. Uh, and, uh, and Philemon here, he hosted the Colossian church in his home. And Paul wrote this letter while he, Paul, was in prison, either in Rome or Ephesus. So we don't really know. He's one of those places. They're not really sure. Scholars are divided on, on where he was at the, at the time. But he was in prison somewhere. And Paul wrote this um, sometime around the year 60 AD, give or take a few years. Now, Paul and Philemon knew each other. Paul, in fact, had played a major role in Philemon's becoming a Christian. And now Paul is imprisoned in another city, but he has come in contact with a man named Onesimus, who is a slave who belongs to Philemon. And so uh, Onesimus probably knew Paul in some way, shape, or form because of that. But Onesimus has run away, and on top of that, it seems he had stolen something from Philemon before he ran away. And now after coming in contact with um, with, with Paul, Onesimus has been helping Paul. At that time, if you were in prison, like Paul was, you would have to rely on other people um, to, to take care of you. The, the authorities, the powers that be might imprison you or keep you locked in your home, but they weren't gonna make they weren't gonna provide food or anything like that. So you were you were kind of at the mercy of friends and family taking taking care of care of you. So Onesimus has been helping Paul. And during this time and through that, Onesimus himself has now become a believer in Jesus through his relationship with Paul. Onesimus is now a Christian as well. So eventually, Paul decides to send Onesimus back to Philemon. He sends him back with this letter that we're going to read here in just a moment. Uh, and it also seems, by the way, that, uh, that this was when, when Paul sent another letter to this church in Colossae, 
Um, this letter uh, that we now know of as the book of Colossians. If you read the end of Colossians, Onesimus is mentioned there as bringing that letter to this church. Um, one other thing that's interesting listen, to listen for as I read this um, is that unlike most of Paul's letters, the vast majority of the time that the word you appears in this letter, it is singular. Um, that's not usually the case with Paul. Uh, normally, when he's writing to the churches, the you is plural, um, but here it's only plural in the opening and closing verses. Everywhere else, it's singular, just one person, you. This is a very personal letter from Paul to Philemon about a very particular circumstance, um, and as we'll see, about how God's grace and salvation and fellowship and all of that are never abstract ideas always manifesting themselves in the particulars and the specifics of life. So here is this letter that Paul sent to Philemon. Um, I'll, of course, be using uh, y'all for those plural yous and just the plain old boring you uh, for the singulars as, as, I, as I read. And, and as I read, also listen to for the, the language of love and family that keeps popping up here. Uh, before we go to God's word, let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Athia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to y'all and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have, not, have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful. The name Onesimus means useful. I don't want to make too much of it here, but God clearly his <coughs> puns are the highest form of humor here. <laughs> he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him. That is my own heart back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I said. One more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping through y'all's prayers to be restored to y'all. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so does Mark, Arist Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with y'all's spirit. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.
So first, one of the things I love about this book, right? did you get a sense, maybe a taste of kind of the, the humanness, we might say, the humanness of Paul coming out in this letter? This is scripture. It is God-inspired, God-breathed, and we absolutely need to hear it and respond to it as such. But it is also, at the same time, written by a real human person. So can you, you can hear Paul pulling out all the stops here, trying to, to guide and lead and push and pull and even control Philemon to, to choose the right thing. Did you catch, did you catch that and, and what Paul was saying there? At times, he sounds very much like a parent to a child, doesn't he, right? Verse 8, I am bold enough. I have the authority, Phil, to command you to do what is right. But I'd rather appeal to you on the basis of love. Right? Parents, you know that tension, don't you? Right? And I, Paul, I do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul is playing the I'm an old man stuck in prison card. <laughs> then in verse 17, so, Philemon, if you consider me your partner, <coughs> treat and welcome Onesimus as you would me. And then my absolute favorite, verse 19. I say nothing about you owing me even your own life. Right? They're making all these requests of Philemon. Paul says, and don't worry, Phil, I'm not going to bring up the fact that you owe me your life. Right? Beautiful, isn't it? How beautiful is that? Right? What a, what a great way to bring that up. Love it. And then the final gem, verse 22. One thing more. Prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping for y'all's prayers to be restored to all of y'all. By the way, Phil, and also everyone else should know, I might be stopping by unexpected. So first of all, let's not lose the humanity that's at play here. Even to finally inspired scripture, right? God, God's grace is something that always works kind of the, the nitty-gritty, rubber meets the road, flesh and blood, life, circumstance, personalities, right? These are real people in real situations, living real lives that God is speaking in and through. But also, through this letter, did you hear and see Paul's heart? What a window we have here into the seriousness and the depth that Paul has in his commitment to following Jesus and its consequences for how Christians are to relate to one another. Right? Think about what he is asking Philemon to do. <clears throat> that requires a profoundly deep conviction about what it means to truly be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a part of the people and family of God. He calls Philemon his brother. He calls Onesimus his brother and his child, no longer a slave, a beloved brother, brother to Paul, yes, but therefore also a brother to Philemon. And in verse 12, when Paul says he is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, he writes, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Now there are a couple words that are often translated as heart in the original Greek language of the New Testament. <coughs> One of those words is cardia. It's the literal, 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 physical heart, the heart that beats in your chest. It's where we get the word cardiology. And cardia was, it was also at that time used as a, as a metaphor of the place where the intellect and the emotions were found, cardia. But that's not the word that Paul uses here when he says he's sending back his, his own heart. He uses uh, the wonderfully fun to say Greek word splachna. Right? <laughs> Go ahead and say it. It is fun to say. Splachna. It is a, oh, beautiful. It's so much fun to say. If you read the King James Version of this verse, this is what it says. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. My splachna means your guts, right? It's the very deepest, most inward part of yourself. Doesn't splachna sound like that's what it should mean, right? It's the deepest, most inward part of who you are, your very identity. It's at the core of who you are. 
The other few times that that word splakna is used in the New, New Testament, it is talking about the deep, tender mercy and passionate affection that God has for his people. A type of deep passion and commitment Jesus has for us. Splakna. He calls Onesimus his very heart. Splachna. Paul is saying, saying so much more than, you know, Philip, try to be nice to this guy, Onesimus, because I've grown kind of fond of him. No, he is saying that who he, Paul, is, is now bound up in who Onesimus is. Because Onesimus has been brought into the family of God, just as Paul has been brought into God's family, just as, by the way, you, Philemon, you have been brought into God's family. So has Onesimus. And so the relationship between you, Philemon, and Onesimus, it cannot stay the same. You are brothers. This, this is where understood correctly and in the full context of what's going on and what Paul is saying in this letter. Paul is dropping a bombshell that should, should have completely destroyed any notions of slavery or supremacy or anything like that. Philemon's culture, Paul's statement here, Onesimus is your beloved brother, it would have been radically subversive of society itself. Because this system of slavery, of bondage, and servitude that was going on, it was integral to the way society worked. Everything was built on those notions of hierarchy. Some people naturally had more status, power, therefore rights, than others. Some maybe didn't have any at all. That was the way life was supposed to be structured in this world. It was what held society together. So to claim otherwise, as Paul does here, would have been a complete subversion of the very fabric of society, a threat to their way of life. Especially if you were making this claim about a slave who had stolen and run away. Onesimus is the lawbreaker here. Philemon has rights against him there would be an expectation that he would use them. Here is Paul claiming that Philemon, despite whatever rights society may, said, may have said that he had over Onesimus, now Paul is saying, no, 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 no. You must welcome him back, not as a slave, but as a beloved brother, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Onesimus is your brother. He is a part of you. In the spiritual sense, yes, of course, he is a brother in the Lord. But this must also work its way into the life you live in the flesh, in society, in your household. Paul is pointing out that what is truly spiritual cannot just stay compartmentalized somewhere else. The gospel of Jesus touches everything and changes everything. By making these claims, that Onesimus is his very heart through Jesus Christ. That Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus, now they are no longer a Jewish Pharisee, a Greek slave master, and a runaway slave. No, they are brothers. Paul is using this little 25 verse letter to point out that the Christian life is not just about you and Jesus. If you are a Christian, you don't just belong to the Lord, belong to the Lord's people as well. You are in his family, and that means you have countless brothers and sisters, many of whom may be separated from you by boundaries created by society, by so-called rights, legal or illegal, documented or undocumented. Boundaries of political affiliation. Boundaries created by guilt, or anger, or fear. Boundaries created by disappointment. Whatever it may be, those divisions are torn down, Paul says. They must be torn down by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
as in Christ. God is not just saving individuals. God is doing that. But God is also building a community. God is creating a people. He's forming a new family. We call this family the church. Big letter C, capital C, church. Throughout the New Testament, this church is also called the body of Christ. The family of God. In verse 6, Paul writes, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. By the sharing of your faith, Paul is not talking about standing on the street corner telling passers-by about Jesus, right? I, I don't think Paul would say not to tell people about Jesus. He was pretty big on that. But that's not what he means here when he says the sharing of your faith. The word there for sharing is the word koinonia, and it's meaning, it's mean, it means sharing, but in, this, in the sense of doing life together, participating together. So Paul is praying that their koinonia, their participating in faith together, the outworking of what he's talking about in this letter, the way he goes on to talk about it, and who they now are as in their relationship with one another, that is what will promote the knowledge of all the good that is, in our, that is ours in Christ. And this, not our own private faith, but that this is how we really grow in Christ. It's how we grow in our knowledge of God's deep love affection for us. Right? Again, notice that while the meat of this letter is addressed specifically to Philemon, at the beginning and the end, he's saying, y'all, it's for the whole community, right? And so, and so it is. For this reason, as Paul writes in verse 8, it's for this reason that he appeals to Philemon to welcome Onesimus back, no longer as a slave, but as a beloved brother. He's asking that Philemon will not act on his rights that society gives him over and against Onesimus, but will instead act on his responsibility and his calling that he has in the Lord to welcome Onesimus back as a brother. It is for this reason, the koinonia of the church, the body of Christ, that Philemon is to welcome Onesimus back as a brother and no longer a slave. Because the way that we as the church God's people, the way that we have koinonia with one another, that is what proclaims what we truly believe about God and about who Jesus is and what God has called and invited us into. Here in this letter to Philemon, Paul is counting on the fact, Onesimus, right, goodness, returning back to Philemon, Onesimus is counting on the fact the gospel can and does change everything, even down to what has been the relationship between a well-to-do master and his runaway slave. The gospel tears down barriers and boundaries, and it calls us into the good gospel work of reconciliation. The work of Jesus Christ proclaimed here in this sometimes historically problematic book about a problem between Onesimus and Philemon, it has the power to take the barriers created by the fear, and anger, sin, and, and even society's expectations and rules and rights between here a fugitive slave and his angry master and tear them down, change them, not just spiritually, but in the flesh, master and slave now beloved brothers. That is the work Paul is calling Philemon into. That is the work that Jesus invites us into and invites us to participate in. When we allow the love and forgiveness that God has offered us, when we allow that to invite, to challenge, to fill out who we are together, that is when we begin to get a picture of the kingdom of God. That is what it is to participate in proclaiming to the world that God is at work and all the goodness that we have in Jesus Christ. This is what the gospel, 
This is what Jesus Christ has done and is doing. So live it and work at it, writes Paul. Let it change everything. Let it change how you see your neighbors, your friends, your family, your enemies, those you have wronged and those who have wronged you. Let it change your very relationships with them. Because the truth is, that this story of Philemon and Onesimus, it is our story as well. As Paul writes elsewhere, we were all once slaves, in bondage to sin, perhaps to our own ambitions, our own pride, perhaps to just the ways we think the world works, perhaps to division and walls between people, to, to institutions that we just accept because it's just the way things are. Even in bondage to division and walls that we put up between us and God, we have been on the run a long time. Some of us for very good reasons. Some of us just because it's all we know how to do. But in Jesus Christ, God says to us, no more. All that is wrong, all that you owe, all that is owed to you has been charged to my account. So family, sisters and brothers, my splachna, Hear this good news. That in Jesus Christ, we are invited back home. No longer as slaves, no longer held in bondage to whatever it is we are, at, we are running from, but as God's beloved daughters and sons, and together as brothers and sisters. And this, this very good news of Jesus Christ family. This changes everything. So may it be so. May it be so in our lives, in our life together. Amen. Amen. I invite you now uh, to stand in body or in spirit.